be such a VIP, shouldn't we keep the PC on the QT? Because if it leads to the VC, he can go MIA, MIA, and then we'll all be on KP. Uh, <laughs> that's what we want to know. <laughs> to the, the expression I've heard is called daddy girl. Um, young blonde ladies, uh, part of Justin, my daughter, um, who kind of speak, you know, that kind of upward inflection. So a teacher uh, once said, we have become the most inarticulate generation since, like, forever. <laughs> and that's what we want to avoid. <laughs> All right, so there will be a prize for whoever calls uh, bingo first. Don't call bingo in the middle of someone's presentation and embarrass them. <laughs> Let's wait until after the applause and after they've got a little gift and then we can do big bingo. All right, so we all know how it works. All right, yes? I think this starts from now. From as soon as I finish this. As soon as the comes on. All right, great. We're live. Uh, with the uh, with the next feed, so please can you share that on? Um, it's coming up on Facebook in five minutes. It'll be on Facebook in a couple of minutes. Please go and pick that up and share that so that people can get it. Uh, so the link is coming up, but it, we are recording. We're recording. We're recording. Great. Okay, then I'm going to introduce Sipiwe. Sipiwe. So Sipiwe was was great. He said to me. He will trust me with his own introduction, with my introduction. So he didn't give me any words to say. So I could say anything I wanted to about him. A couple of years ago, in Wired magazine, uh, one of the journalists came up with a um, an expression called "a thousand true fans." He said, "If we, as creatives, as producers of content, know who our thousand true fans are, it really helps us in our business, because then we can tap into them. What is it that they're looking from uh, for from us?" If we had a podcast, what, what are they wanting to hear? If we can produce content that meets their needs, that is in line with what we're doing, uh, then we have a stream of income. We can keep selling products to them because they want what we have. They will become our virtual PR agents. So I, I looked at the thousand true fans a lot in our mastermind. We've discussed it. And, and I think it's a really great concept that we should all be aware of. But I would like to hear and Moyo to know, if he ever makes his list of 1,000 true fans, I must be on it soon. Ah. <laughs> and if Sapiwe runs for anything ever, you have my vote, sir. So Sapiwe is the uh, president of the South African Board of People Practitioners. He's been on our online meeting and he shared some great insights about what corporates, what um, businesses are looking for when they hire speakers. And he's going to kind of, you know, touch on some of that as well. He is the co-founder and chief people officer at Twice Blue with his uh, partner, Alex Granger, and Rufiwe. <coughs> and um, you'll see a lot of that kind of stuff on Facebook because they show, show quite a lot. Um, they're great work. So Sapiro is going to talk to us about, uh, in hindsight, how, um, how we can build our speaking businesses. So if you can please give a warm welcome to Sapiro. <laughs> Thank you very much, Charlotte. And, um, the payment is coming for that intro. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, hi, everybody. Hi. Hi. One more time. Hi. Thank you. So I don't know about other speakers, but one of the things that happened to me when I heard that I'll be speaking at the convention, you you get so tempted to impress. You you want your best lines, your best intros, and you feel like taking some of the things that you know from your keynotes that work all the time. And, and I have those, I don't know about you, but I have killer lines that work all the time. I don't care who's in the audience, it will work. So I, I was really tempted to do that, but I thought, you know what, that's not gonna help at all. So I'm gonna chill and we're gonna chat and we're gonna chat about something that I, I'm, I'm really reflecting. So as we connect the dot back, backwards, I just wanna reflect on what I think, you know, accelerated my speaking business exponentially and what I think, you know, one or two tips that can help somebody else to, to be able to do that in, in, the, in the last few years. Because I don't know, you know, the speaking business and any other industry is also uh, very, very funny because sometimes you really feel like you are a striker, you feel like I should be the one in front, I should be uh, speaking everywhere, but it looks like the industry is just putting you in the bench, like, no, <laughs> let him sit down, uh, let him just chill a bit. You feel like you should be an open, uh, a top order batsman, you should be a Hashin Amla, a Quintin Tikok, and so on. You feel like you should be there, but at the moment you are busy giving other people drinks. You are what we call in cricket the 12th man. And you are busy saving others and you are helping them change the gloves 
and you feel like, no man, I should be the one there. And often you sit and watch other people do what you're passionate about, what you really love, and you feel like you should be in that stage, but you are talented and frustrated. So that's the journey that I've been going through in the last maybe eight years or so, and I just wanna share what, is, what has evolved because something has changed for me in the last few years. And I just wanna reflect as we go, we'll reflect, I'll chat, and, and we will see. There are two, you, you don't know whether you're being pruned or you're being cut off, anyway. There are two main events that got me very, very frustrated in the last few years. The first one was uh, this event, we still had this logo. It was on the 12th of December, 2012. Carl was the Johannesburg chapter president and she, he organized with the team a nice breakfast uh, somewhere in the East Rand. Uh, I don't know if you re who remembers that breakfast. Anybody? Jacques, of course, uh, institutional memory. Uh, <laughs> so there were five panelists there that we, we had. We had Steph was there, Billy was there, Gavin Shapples was there, Michael Jackson, and I think Gary Bailey. Gary Bailey. Gary Bailey was there. And so people were sharing about what is going on in their speaking business, and I was sitting there. There were like big figures, and I'm like people doing amazing things. I was like, oh my God. I will never be able to do such things. And people were dropping some really scary numbers on how their business is growing, but sharing. They were not gloating or anything, but they were sharing. And I was so frustrated. I was like, mm, I will never be able to do any of the things that people are talking about. They are way ahead of me. And, and they were, uh, to be honest. And they still are because they are our seniors in the industry. It frustrated me a lot, but it provoked me so hard as well. The second one happened in 2013. I was in part of the panel in some event industry summit and I was in the panel as a the new speaker and and I really was new and and I was in the panel with these guys and someone put up a stat in that convention and said there are about 300 conferences in South Africa every year and and these people are professional conference organizers and you know and they said obviously not everyone not every conference is going to need a speaker but there are 300 every day actually, every day in the country. And I was like, if there are 300 conferences every day, why am I speaking once in three months? You know, <laughs> I, I really don't understand. And, and, and that was so true for me. And, and I had to go and reflect and think about what was happening. And at that time I was transitioning from corporate to, to speaking. So, you know when you're in that transitional zone, that tension zone where the things that you are doing no longer excite you, you want to be a speaker. And you're hearing things that you, and, and people are saying you can never live on keynoting, it's impossible. Uh, that's why we have to do other things. And you're like, but this is what I want. I promise this is what I want. And you are not sure how, how to do that. And, <laughs> but the other thing I was doing, I was attributing all of my, uh, not failures, but my lack of bookings to everything else but me. And, and it, was, it was everything else. I, I, People, people don't have content, they're just playing on stage. I'm deep, I, <laughs> I, I, I have something to say. And I attributed my, my, lake, my lack of booking to everybody else but me. And until one day, you know, when you decide that, you know what, I, I probably need to think about this uh, and move from I deserve to be on stage to I'm responsible to make this thing happen. Mm -hmm. And it's a big shift for us in the industry, I'm telling you, uh, you can complain a lot about the fact that you do not get booked and so on, but sometimes you have to sit down and ask yourself, why is it that I'm not getting these bookings? And it is, it is tough. It is tough to look within and say, maybe there's something that I'm not doing well, and I have to go to that journey uh, myself. So when I chat about what I found in my journey and what you can think about in your own journey as well, because it was really, really tough for me to get into, into that state. So let me reflect about a few things that I changed and a few things that I want to uh, change. The first thing is, when I got into speaking, I, this was my best keynote ever. I still think it's the best. You know, I, I launched a keynote called Bulls and Bears Life Lessons from the Financial Market. I wrote a book uh, about it and it was, it was rocking. I, I was really, really good. And, but nobody booked it, you know? <laughs> And that thing, that thing was really good. I, you know, I, the way I used the, the market as a metaphor was just working. But nobody really booked it. And I thought to myself, they don't know good stuff, these people. And, you know, uh, until I had to realize that, you know what, so I worked at the bank, 
But there was a bit of a credibility gap with this bulls and bears thing. Nobody had booked it ever. And even though I had worked in the bank, I worked in HR, you know. And I think people couldn't resonate, you know. This guy with markets and HR and whatever, I was saying it well, I prepared well. But there's always that credibility gap that people are looking for something else. They're looking for you. And they can't find you in this well-rehearsed thing. And uh, they, I think pe people didn't believe me. People, there was this thing that, no, man, we don't believe that this guy know, knows this thing. So I've never invoiced even one client on, on this amazing keynote. I can do it for you anytime. I, like, I can really do it for you. It's really, really hot, you know? <laughs> so I've never, and I mean, even when people order my books now, they are not interested in that book. They just don't want anything. So I had to withdraw it. I withdrew that keynote from, from my website for a few things and I reflected on, on why, what, what, why, why that was happening. And I changed, came up with a new keynote and that had worked before. I had to reflect about a few things. I said, why do people book me? Those who have booked me in these four gigs a year, why are they booking me? <laughs> and, and, I found, and I found some really good stuff there. And it was becoming clear that people were booking me for three things. One. Uh, my humor. I was funny yeah. and, and I was really, really funny. And, but, <laughs> but I didn't want to be known as a funny guy. And, and I was doing after dinner speeches and I was asked to come and speak after, night, after lunch, you know? They are, they are sitting down and they are, they are full and we just want you. And I was like, no, man, there's more. I promise there's more. I am deep, I have solid content. But the people were like, can you just make people laugh, you know? <laughs> and I battled with that for a very long time. The second one is people wanted motivation and inspiration for me and encouragement and so on. And, and I also was resisting that big time because I had heard in one of our PSA meetings that this motivational speaking thing is dying. And, and I tried so much to position myself as a business speaker, but people were like, can you just tell me that story? You know, that train story. I'm like, no, 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 I, I want to speak about the future of work. They're like, can you tell me that story, you know? And, and I had to come down and give people what they do. So that was the second thing. The third thing was HR for me, because I had a background in HR, and, and it was genuine, people could connect. So I had to ask myself those deep questions and try and change. And I think we need to reflect about that because people will tell you what they want you for. And no matter how much you push what you want, uh, I think the audience will tell you uh, what, what, what they want. And, and what happened is that a few years ago, we went to the NSA convention. It was in, in, in Washington, DC. Charlotte was there, uh, um, Richard was there, as well, so we're hanging around having fun, and Steph was there, obviously in the executive lounge. <laughs> so during during one of the breaks, uh, Steph says to me, "Come here," uh, and says, "What can I do for you here?" So I'm like, "You know what? I'd really appreciate just two minutes with Team Guard." And, and Steph says, okay, I'll, 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 I'll sort you out. So Steph fetches team guard and he says, can you give this young man two minutes? He has potential. Um, but two minutes, two minutes. Don't talk too long. Talk to team. So I'm like, thanks, Steph. And the two minutes with team guard. And so I say to team, you know, you are a humorist. You know, you do these crazy gags on stage. You do these fun things. I'm not even about that life. I still wear a suit. But, you know... I, I have humor and I'm struggling with this. Can I be myself? Can I afford to be a serious business person and do this humor thing? Tim says, what are you talking about? You know how many people would love to be funny? You know, obviously speakers, all of us think we're funny, but you know, there, there are levels to this thing, you know? So, <laughs> so Tim says, what are you on about? You know how many people would love to be funny? Uh, embrace that thing and uh, do you, man. Uh, forget about whatever he's saying. Do you and you'll see uh, what's going to happen. So I decided to embrace that. And, and it really, really helped me. So I did, after dinner speeches, after that, with pride and, and with, uh, you know, excitement and knowing that this is what the, the audience wants for me. So that was the first thing that I kind of changed on that. The second thing that was happening that I really didn't like is... Um, so the people who started booking me as well say, 
So we would go to briefing meetings and we'd be like, you know, we wanted so and so for the big event, but we just don't feel he'll connect to the factory workers. You know, you look like you can connect with the people. What, I, what, what do you do? What do you mean? What do you mean? I can speak to executives as well. So I tried this executive speaker thing. I tried to position myself as board advisor, whatever. You know how you know those titles, board advisor, whatever. And people were like, come and talk to our shop floor. And for a very long time, I was offended. I was like, this is, you know, I studied, man. This is not happening. <laughs> Eventually, I'm like, no, you don't speak to CEOs, people. Eh? Chill, relax, change your entire thing, go for that ex exact audience that people are wanting you. And that's a picture of me about to speak in a factory, and I was doing it proudly. I started speaking there in jeans and overalls, and I would speak the same language as people because I come from the same background, and that really helped. Wow. So what am I saying? I think let's not be obsessed with these titles. Like, you don't advise boards. Can we like relax? It, like, if you don't, you don't. Uh, just relax and do you. Is that all right? Yeah? That makes sense to me because I I tried and you know you know when I when I started speaking I I tried to be like Billy for obvious reasons. Uh, you know. <laughs> the proper stuff man. really could advise executives I'm like you know what I can't I can't do this stuff and I stuck with my audience and it has helped me grow I speak to senior people now but it's because I embraced that the other thing that I learned is that your audience kind of gives you a chance so first they are interested in your charisma and your jokes and whatever but they can't bring you back for that so they they pull you in they give you a chance to develop solid content and, and, and after that, they're going to require that content, you know, they're going to require it. So the kind of clients that have gone back, I mean, the clients have gone to speak for like 10 times and there is no way you can get away with uh, this making jokes thing. They want content, they want you to teach. Then I started teaching and, and I've been teaching in a few business schools and it's been amazing how uh, when, when people say we don't really need you for big content, but we want to know it's there. So that if we were to ask you to do a three hour seminar on this, you can do it without fail. And I realized that, you know, as you start, people give you a chance, but they're gonna come back to you and say, we demand more. And, and sometimes when you are not being booked, and I, and, I, and I think this is so true, when you're not being booked, nobody wants your speech, nobody wants anything, it's very easy to become despondent. But I think you must just develop content more and more. Because when it starts, when they start knowing who you are, they're gonna want everything you've done. And you have to use that time when you're not busy to develop this content because there's going to come a time when they demand it, they, uh, demand it from you. So I, I started doing that as well. I don't know what's my next slide, so I have to look. <laughs> <laughs> and the other thing for me, you know, I, I, I did a, a bit of an experiment. So I, I put my website, spiomore.co.za, I put it on freeze for about four months. So I haven't, I haven't had a website for four months. And I wanted to check what people are saying that, you know, social media is just social, it doesn't work and whatever. People want websites, they want where you belong. And, and I realized that for me, uh, social media gives me the most business. I get, I get most of my business from Facebook, like not even LinkedIn, from Facebook. And, and I'm so chilled on Facebook. I'm myself, I post what I like. I do most business on inboxes and so informally and, and, and then I get someone else to follow the lead and it, it, it gets closed. So I think, you know, the, the social media thing is real, you know, and, and for four months I haven't had a website and my bookings have not gone down, you know, and, and I speak a lot now, you know, I don't even know whether we're allowed to say that because from, I think once in three months I kind of like speak a lot, you know. Um, <laughs> I think I speak on average four times a week, uh, so it's really, really good. You know, it's it's going well, and and you know, some of it comes from social media, some from bureaus, obviously, but uh, my, my, most of my engagements come from social media. So we have to look after the the social media. So I thought I'll you know be short so that if there's one question or two, but these are my reflections. To be honest with you, uh, these seven things. Firstly, be you. Don't try to be anybody else. 
uh, executives are tired of speakers who try to be everybody else. They are tired. We say the same stories. We sound the same. And, and it's so interesting that you know you're good when people think they can do what you do. You know when they say, ah, man, it was easy. We can do it. That's, that's how you know you are really, really good. You look so unrehearsed. They're like, you know, we like that raw, unrehearsed thing. You're like, you have no idea of how much I've been rehearsing this thing. <laughs> so, so be you. It always helps. Uh, the second one is don't let your marketing be better than your stage presence. You know, I think some of us have sleek websites, and which is really cool. But when you are there, uh, can you really deliver? Can you bring it? Because, uh, and, and I know sometimes, as I was saying, sometimes you blame everybody else, but you have to look at your own stage presence. And Douglas was saying, you know, on a 45 minute keynote, we have to be mesmerizing. There's just no doubt about it. The, the debate around content versus delivery, it's an academic debate. People fear boredom more than they want your wisdom. They, they are scared of boredom. Once you get into that stage, they just fear, oh my God, it's going to be a long 45 minutes. That's why you have to paint pictures and do whatever. So we need to do that. Now, number three, what I learned, if it doesn't work, drop it quickly. Uh, I, think if, if, I think I've dropped maybe two or three keynotes now. <laughs> I still have two keynotes. I really have two. I, I, I'm, not, I'm not about to launch a keynote all the time. I have two. And I remember Steph says, is your first keynote at least 70% good now? Because the last time I saw it, it was 30%. I'm like, ah, Steph, you know? And, 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 and I think my first keynote, I can repeat it again and again and again now because I'm comfortable. But it doesn't work, drop it. Um, that, that grace period that your clients give you, in my view, um, when you, when you kind of start, I'm in that period now where I'm on the five years, between five years and ten years as, as a speaker, so I'm still young in this thing. And, but I, I found out that people who kind of make it into that first five years, it's because of the content that you bring in. And, and people want to feel that you have that thing. And then just take responsibility. You know, I, I, I just, you know, someone said to me, and I was just so sad, you know, and I was just so sad. So someone says to me, yeah, you spirit, you know, hey, you are, you are booked a lot now, ne? and I'm like, you know, because I don't do this false humility thing anymore. I'm like, yeah, 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 absolutely, you know. I used to do it, I, was, I used to say I'm trying, but I'm not, I am booked, you know. And he says, yeah, you are, you are lucky, ne? I'm like, no, no, why, why do you think it's luck? And, and I think if you attribute somebody's success to luck, you are missing the point. You, you don't want to learn anything. And I'm still learning. I, I'm learning a lot. I'm a sponge. You know, I can tell you things that happen in the PSA every meeting for the past five years. Uh, except where I was not there. But, you know, <laughs> <laughs> but let's just learn and take responsibility. I don't know why we love blaming and saying this and this. But let, let's do it. The customization thing is a big deal, and that spoke about it. I, I decided to customize most of my talks as well. And it's amazing when people see you just 10% or 20% saying their stories and the things that they have. They, it's just amazing. You just see them turning uh, around. So how I do my talks now, I customize the first, the first like, OK, my intro is almost the same. The first two minutes is my intro, and then I start sounding like them. I speak. Uh, I speak a lot in banks, so I speak Bengalese, and then, <laughs> and then I come back to my keynote, and you can see them. Okay, oh, at least he knows, you know, and and that works all the time. So I do that, and then lastly, can we like relax? We are not all CEOs. Uh, go for the market that you are supposed to go for. There's there's work for all of us here, and I think um, the games that we sometimes play, uh, they're not helping. You know, if this market gives you work. Stick to it, grow it, and you'll be able to do what you're supposed to do. I think my time is up. No, I have 10 minutes for, for, for a chat and so on. The train and story. The train story. So this is... <laughs> that is, you know, Steph, every time I go to briefings, it is crazy. I, I try and position the other deep stuff, and I'm like, I, I promise you, I've just done 10 factors into what makes an amazing culture. Like, can you just tell the train story? <laughs> and the train story has gotten me most of my business. Uh, but it's true. I, I, never, I never knew. Uh, I think I had someone talk about a signature story uh, in one of the, the meetings. I never knew that there's something like that, but I've found one. You know, I, I've found one, and... 
and I think it takes time to do that. I think someone was asking, when do you kind of say, I speak on one thing? And I think that probably two or three years ago says, there has to come a time when you can be known with one thing. I'm still not there, and I think it takes a bit of time. As you understand yourself, you change, you find out, you change this and that, and you kind of get into that. But I do have a signature story, and I don't feel, um, I don't feel embarrassed at all repeating it, because people who don't understand, you know, people who don't understand our world, they say, you've been saying that story for three years. I'm like, dude, there are people who've been saying their stories for 20 years. Leave me alone, you know? I'm still, I'm still new here, you know? Leave me alone. So it, it really does work. I, I don't know if there's any other comment. Anything? Are we good? You want to hear it? So it was the 4th of July 2002, and I was standing at the train station in Orange Farm called Stratford Station. I used to take a train, train number 9003 from Orange Farm to my work. And I remember on the 4th of July 2002, it was dark and it was cold. And a friend of mine standing next to me says to me, you know what's pure? This thing of waking up so early in the morning to rush for trains must stop. We must work hard and get out of this informal settlement. Surely there are better lives out there. We can buy ourselves cars and houses like other children. So when he says that to me, I look at him and we connect like they do in the days of our lives. And I'm like, oh. <laughs> And I'm like, Amandra, let's work hard and get out of this place, comrade. So he's, that was the 4th of July, 2002. I go back to Orange Farm in 2015, and I find that my friend is still traveling in that same train. 13 years later, train number 9003. And I ask him, my friend, what happened to our dreams? We're supposed to work hard and get out of this place. And my friend looks me in the eye and says to me, you know what's Piwe? It's the system. <laughs> the system has marginalized us and ostracized us. And we say, when he says that, my heart just sank. And I can never laugh, but what my friend missed was that there were other people who've grown up in Orange Farm who've done amazing things for their lives. Some of our friends are senior executives, some are entrepreneurs, some are lawyers and doctors, some are amazing speakers speaking to you today. <laughs> <laughs> But we learn something in that story that things don't just happen. You're never going to change your life by osmosis. If you want anything, you have to look yourself in the mirror and say, if it's to be, it's up to me. Thank you. <laughs> I, I just went into that stage mode. Thank you. for 50 bucks, and we call ourselves the professional poker players. You can come and introduce your story through the bull if you can bear us. It'll be an unpaid gift, but I will show you up on a card. <laughs> <laughs> the, the one thing I didn't say about going, uh, when you are speaking for more than five years, <laughs> is that you choose your free gigs very <laughs> I think I'm done. Thank you very much, everybody. Um, so if you just give the team a moment to come